Hi and welcome. This is Andres Bonnet live from uh, Brussels on this wonderful day to talk about the AST3 internal competition and what you need to know and our various pieces of advice to help your preparation. I just want to make sure that the audio works fine. And I'm asking my team who are working diligently in the back to be sure that everyone can hear me, see me the way it was planned to happen. And hopefully that's a great, okay, sound is great on, on your end, wonderful. So why don't you type into the chat box as we always do in these kind of events, where you are dialing in from so you can visualize and locate where the chat box is. And throughout the webinar, you can ask questions, you can add comments, and you can orient my uh, presentation and the topics that I cover in a way that is most appealing to you so I can answer questions that are most relevant for your preparation and things that you are particularly concerned or confused about. With that, it seems everyone is on board. Everybody seems to have uh, succeeded in connecting. This was a sound check, but uh, we probably can skip that. Hopefully, everything works fine. And there's even an app for this particular software. But just trying a different browser usually fixes the problem, if anything. So with that, a few words. I won't bore you with my background. You might know the work uh, of uh, the EU training team and the EU training as a service that I've been involved with for many, many years, along with the Ultimate EU Testbook. And I myself used to be a commission official many, many years ago. Now, today's agenda is the following. We're going to look at the AST3 internal competition for future commission staff. And obviously, you are already in the commission in one way or another to qualify to be eligible for this particular competition. So we'll have a very quick overview of the notice of competition and put that in context. Perhaps more importantly, we'll look at the EU knowledge part. That seems to be of the greatest concern for most candidates as to how are you going to cover that vast body of knowledge, which we refer to as EU knowledge. It's really kind of endless, but hopefully after this webinar, you will have a better understanding of what you need to focus on and to which level or, or to what depth you need to go in understanding the various facets, the various aspects of European affairs. And then we'll look at the written test as to what it is, what we know about it. I will be always very upfront and transparent if I don't know something or we just don't have the information yet, but most likely you will be given that information as we get close to the exam. And then ideas on how to prepare and then a brief uh, discussion on the oral test, the oral presentation interview and how to prepare. So hopefully that's going to make sense. It's a lot of material to cover and uh, we are sharing the presentation afterwards. We are sharing the recording afterwards and we are sharing a special discount code towards the end for our digital products including the EU e-learning course that we have recently released. So all of that is going to be available to you. And of course, those who are at the live event right now are going to be able to ask questions, put those live questions to me. I'll do my best to answer them. Agi is in the background and she's helping me go through the questions if there are many coming in. But again, whatever is not answered today, we'll do our best to come back to it and then write maybe a memo or some other format. So with that, let's get into the more substantive parts and look at the competition overview. So in a nutshell, and perhaps just to begin with a disclaimer, as we always do, make sure that it's the notice of competition that you rely on. And everything I tell you is to the best of our knowledge, but I might be mistaken or hopefully I will not make any errors, but still the notice of competition is the the source of all knowledge and wisdom, uh, but certainly in legal sense, that is what you need to refer to for accurate and official uh, information. So with that, AST3 competition, there are two profiles, as you know, the budget and finance assistance and the coordination assistance with different number of places. You might wonder how many applicants are expected. That's anyone's guess. It's really very hard. I would even say impossible to estimate at this point how many candidates there will be, perhaps 10 times more, perhaps 15 times more, but it's not something that we can know upfront. Usually, 
if a competition is run by EPSO, they calculate or they, they disclose that information. Now, this is particularly a commission internal competition, so I'm not sure that DGHR will disclose that, but hopefully they do. At least you will know the proportions of how many places there are on the reserve list and how many applicants will be. But again, this is not something that you can know upfront. And then when it comes to the tasks, so complex assistance and support tasks, and then reporting the managers, administrators, that's uh, pretty, pretty, let's say standard. And it's all in the annex of the notice of competition and the eligibility is certainly you need to be a national of the EU state. And there are a lot of other conditions depending on what your current stat status is with the commission. And then the languages. So one word about the languages, it's pretty standard, meaning that you need to have at least two languages. So thorough knowledge, uh, which is language one, can be any of the 24. And then language two could, well, not theoretically be any of the 24 because there is uh, the, the precondition that language two has to be English, French, or German. So language one, can be any of the EU's 24 official languages and the language two, English, French, or German. One interesting note as a, as a footnote here, those of you who are following the EPSO exams and all the, 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 the Brazilian soap opera that EPSO is these days and the, the various changes and rumors and updates around that, well, they have released a new language regime, as you may have seen, and in the competition that they have relaunched, there they are using language let's say 24 and 24 as long as language two is different from language one so again that that's that's the EPSO domain and in that case it's a slightly different revised new language regime but in here in this particular competition the st3 you have basically any of the 24 and then english french or german pretty straightforward all right so with that Let's go on and see what language two is actually used for. So it's used for application form, uh, EU knowledge test, the written test, the oral test, and basically any com uh, communication with the secretariat. So essentially, the EU knowledge test will be in English, French, or German. And that has a certain impact on your preparation because the names of institutions or EU programs, and perhaps occasionally abbreviations, will need to be in that particular language. So you are advised to be familiar with the terminology in the language that you will take the exam in. So the typical classic example, European Council, Council of Europe, uh, Council of Ministers and all of that, uh, there are different uh, permutations of the translation when it's not in English. Uh, um, I don't speak German, but I do speak French. So again, there you have maybe just uh, one, one uh, preposition or, or one little word might might make such a difference. So again, be familiar with the EU specific terminology in the particular language in which you will take the exam. And then uh, selection process, as you know, 27th of March will is the deadline. So that gives us basically exactly two weeks on the day of the recording of this particular webinar. Then there is the eligibility check when you need to provide a document and then come the tests. Now, as far as I know, the tests are planned for probably around June, but again, we'll see how that planning goes. It's certainly a helpful uh, reference point for your preparation because you know how to plan your time. There's still quite a bit of time until that. And uh, planning went out last night, I can see that. So you certainly have uh, even more up-to-date information than I do. So those of you who, who, who got that or, or are aware of that, maybe you want to put that into the chat so others uh, will, be, will be familiar with that. Point is that there is a pre-selection test, which is on the same day, presumably for all candidates, uh, which comprises EU knowledge, uh, multiple choice quiz, and a written test. And then there is the second part, which is the oral test the, with an oral presentation and an interview. But then again, that doesn't happen on the same day. That happens later for those who have passed the pre-selection part. So with those kind of basics in place, I'd like to share a few ideas, a few insights and, and tips on the EU knowledge part and then on the other components of this particular competition as well. 
So the EU knowledge test is probably the one that induces the most stress for most candidates. And for good reason, because it covers EU knowledge. Now, that is vast, right? That covers a lot of ground with so many different branches and so many different strata of knowledge that it may be hard to decide, hard to know which direction you want to go and what is it that you are expected to know. So I'll give you my take on this and, and I trust that will be helpful for your preparation. So the, the EU knowledge part is basically, in, in my view, is split into four big blocks in four big modules. You could maybe say five, but let's say roughly four big modules. And, and, and the first being EU history and decision making. So again, history could be put aside and in the notice of competition, it's not specifically mentioned. So that probably is not something you want to spend a lot of time on, maybe just for context and for better understanding of the, the way the EU machinery works you would want to look at that but again it's quite unlikely that you'll get questions on in which year was the the merger treaty signed or when did the the treaty of amsterdam come into force so again you might want to look at that to some degree but it's not that you this is a history class on the other hand the decision making procedures are really important because as we will see when we look at the institutions and that's part two or three, depending on how you count it. So that's the next part. How do institutions work together? And that is essentially the decision-making, the different processes and different procedures, which you are well advised to learn about and well advised to, to know pretty well. Certainly many of you are working in those particular units or those particular uh, DGs where this is kind of the daily daily operation that you deal with. But others may be much less exposed. So when it comes to the ordinary legislative procedure, comes to the, leg the, the special legislative procedure, so uh, the, the, the consent or the consultation procedure, and then there's comitology, implementing and delegated acts or regulatory procedure with scrutiny, budgetary procedure. So this could be pretty technical. But again, especially for the OLP, and maybe to some degree, the, the implementing delegated acts, those are fairly important. And having at least some understanding, some notion on where do they fit into the system, this is something that you are well advised to be familiar with. And then again, as I said before, with the institutions, that's in the context of how the various EU institutions work together. And then uh, so with Commission, Parliament and Council being the decision-making triangle, the institutions with the most uh, visibility, with the most political influence. So again, Commission is where, where you are at right now. So that is something you probably know fairly well already. But then, then there is a Parliament, the different committees. Uh, how are the different uh, presidents or chairmen or chairwomen, how are they elected or appointed? What majorities are in place? What deadlines are there in place? How long is the mandate of the component members of these various institutions? And, and then again, that doesn't re does, it's not limited only to the European, uh, let's say the Commission, Parliament and Council, but also for European Council, also for Court of Justice and also for other advisory or consultative bodies and, and committees. So let's say Committee of Regions, uh, Economic Social Committee, and then perhaps to a lesser extent, the, the various financial institutions like Central Bank and Investment Bank. And then you have the Court of Auditors, Ombudsman, Data Protection Supervisor. And then you have the External Action Service, which is, um, well, legally speaking, it's not an institution. So according to a treaty, it's, it's not an institution but it's an important uh, well service in the institutional setup. So again, having some notion of what is its basic mandate, what role does it have, and how does it relate to the other institutions through which processes, what is its level of input when it comes to certain policies like uh, development policy or trade policy and certainly 
foreign security and, um, and foreign policy and security policy. So this is kind of the, 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 the baseline to some degree. But what I'm saying is you don't necessarily need to have the same level of depth when it comes to the central bank, for instance. So understanding what its role in the, in the, the, the monetary policy of the EU, uh, some idea about its setup, uh, and again, its governing bodies and, and, and various other functions, but perhaps you won't need more than that, as opposed to the main institutions and from court and, and council and European council and all the others, where you, you need more depth of understanding the different working groups and what's core repair and how does that work with the, the, the various levels of decision-making and uh, political and policy-making bodies. And then having said all of that, you certainly have a large number of agencies. So all these agencies, which are spread all over Europe, as, as you know, have at least a basic notion of their, their name, their function, and where are they based? And again, how do they connect to the other institutions, which is typically the commission that they are linked with, even if legally speaking, the agencies are, are, are independent, but they do have some special relationship with the European Commission. So if you look at some agencies which are more on the regulatory side, so risk the risk assessment kind of agencies like the medicines agency in Amsterdam, the European Food Safety Authority in Parma, or, or ECA in uh, Helsinki, the, the chemical uh, agency in, in Helsinki, or Frontex, for that matter, in the context of, of uh, border control, have some understanding of how they relate to the commission, or more specifically to uh, one DG or another that they, that they are under the supervision of, or where they provide input into, let's say, DG Environment and the European Environment Agency you probably don't need greater depth than that. So when you look at, say, the European Institute for Gender Equality, again, understand what they do, where they're based, and what level of influence do they have on policymaking. And that's probably enough. So agencies, as far as I know, I think there are 51 of them. So there is a great number of agencies that uh, are, are out there. But in the, in the great scheme of things and the in EU institutional setup, they're relatively, uh, let's say, I, I, want, I don't want to discount their importance, but we're looking at the exam, looking at what you need to know for this particular competition. So again, they are, they are not the main show, right? But with those, with those points that I just underlined, beyond that, I don't think you need to go any deeper than, than that level of knowledge. So again, for the sake of reference, you have that all on the slides. You can easily look them up. Um, there are, there are uh, collections and, and various websites where all of them are, are listed. And then you have these, say, the European Defense Agency, which is a bit particular because they are directly linked to the European External Action Service and not the European Commission for that matter. But again, since they deal with defense procurement, so they are linked to, to various parts of, of, of the Commission from an internal market perspective. So again, have some basic understanding of where they fit in the overall picture uh, and then and what they do, where are they based. And that's pretty much it for the agencies. Uh, and then, by the way, uh, quite a number of agencies are, are pretty involved in the execution or, or the, the management of certain EU funds. So essentially project and financial management of particular projects under certain policy priorities. So that is about the agencies and then come the big topic of policies right so we had history we had decision making we had institutions and agencies and then come the policy part and to some degree the policies are, are the trickiest because it's a, a bit of a moving target it's a an organic thing that's what the eu does right the very reason why the institutions exist and why the commission is in the driving seat to to vary varying degree is that they are shaping and forming and managing policies. So the question is, to what depth you need to study these policies? And, and what are the policies? Well, we mapped them out for you. So this is pretty much the, the menu. And unfortunately, it's not a la carte. You need to uh, have uh, everything. But again, 
not everything to the same degree, to the same depth. If you take, for instance, um, let me just pick one, say customs policy. So customs policy, super important, but again, in terms of what you may be expected to know about it, you will not be asked about what's the excise taxation of uh, tobacco imports, right? That, that, that would be pretty nonsensical. So have an understanding of where the customs policy fits in, roughly a half page or a one pager of, of description of that particular policy, but perhaps not so much more. Same goes for taxation. And then I would contrast that with policies which gain, which have a lot of political importance that have that are really in the spotlight for partly because of the of of of, of the commission president's political priorities and partly because of real life events so you take energy you take environment you can take um uh, to some degree foreign security policy uh, you may take uh well there's a single market with all its uh different angles and and aspects so there are some policies which 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 seem to be pretty top of top of mind top of the political agenda and it, i would probably put here also the digital digital aspects or, or or you could call that under business and industry perhaps we should add the word uh, digital there just for for good measure so it's not uh, forgotten because if you think about artificial intelligence you think about the Digital Markets Act, these are, are very prominent and very visible and very high profile policy areas where at least have some understanding of what the EU's priorities are. What, what is the EU doing? You are advised to understand how much power does the EU have in one of these areas? So can they pass binding legislation on certain aspects? by and large when it's single market related then yes and then when it's uh, under different uh, policy or decision making headings it's to a lesser degree and then understand what are the, the the key building blocks of that policy is and then which direction is it heading is it heading is there a strategy has there been a strategy in place that's been endorsed or approved on the highest political level then again, being familiar with what the EU wants to do with 2030 or in, in 10, 15, 20 year time span, that is helpful. Now you are probably wondering, okay, it's still a huge amount of, of data and, and a lot of material. Now there are different resources. I'm gonna share a couple with you where you can have summaries, where you can have um, fact sheets and, and, and different formats, which kind of shrink the amount of information that, that you can that, that you need to know. And then as a side note, by the way, you can even experiment with ChatGPT and other tools where you put in certain links or PDFs and other documents and, and ask that to summarize it with the caveat that uh, don't put their confidential information and don't put their or whatever outcome or what output uh, comes your way, exercise uh, judgment that uh, it's accurate it, it's not always as as precise as we would want that to be but it's probably going to improve over time now what are the resources a couple pointers couple ideas there official resources like um, or official sources obviously eu institution websites agencies bodies maybe just one word of uh, caution or i say that with a bit of a smirk that depending on which institution's website you find a summary or information on well they will highlight the importance and the role of that particular institution and i'm looking at you european parliament where if it's a parliament fact sheet they will certainly highlight uh, even more than it might be academically uh, let's say justified the role and the importance of that particular institution but that's that's fine just be aware of that but again uh typically commission and parliament are the ones who put out the most um accessible and, and often most helpful uh, resources and summaries and and information sheets so those are helpful often press releases are a shortcut to understanding a particular policy because if the commission comes out with fit for 55 or it comes out with with some really 
really a major initiative, then typically they would have a press release with it or a citizen's summary if it's a piece of legislation. Now, those are wonderful shortcuts for you to understand what that particular piece of legislation or initiative is about. And that's what you're looking for, a shortcut in the sense that it's, 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 it's from an official source, so you can trust it. And at the same time, you don't need to read through 10, 15, 20 pages for that particular matter because they gave a, a pretty succinct, pretty pointed summary that tends to be quite helpful. And then there, there are uh, collections of EU glossary terms, and, and I use the term uh, fact sheet. So that is a term that you might want to Google and look around for fact sheets. And then number two is legislative summaries. So that's another term, fact sheets and legislative summaries. These are, are terms that you can search for, and usually they yield pretty good results. And again, try to prioritize sources that are the EU official sources, because if it's a think tank, if it's an academic institute or other, exercise caution and, and, and always check how up-to-date and accurate the information is. And then there is the Parliament's Research Center. So they are really doing a great job in summarizing different policies using infographics and, and other visual, visual tools where they provide, as the name suggests, pretty good research, pretty good summaries on various aspects of EU legislation, of EU policies and, and other priorities. And then you have the Legislative Observatory. Uh, you can Google that by the, or, or, or pull it up, those of you who, who are not familiar with it, with uh, so it's O. E I L, like the French word for I. And you, you just put a European Parliament and you'll find it. That is the legislative tracker. So there you can find any official document uh, and, and especially for, for primary uh, and secondary, no, primary legislation where you can see the timeline and the different actors and, and those who were involved in adopting a particular piece of legislation. It's not exactly a summary of a, of a policy area or how an institution works. But again, if you want to look into one specific document, that's a pretty good resource that you can you can peruse. And then there's the Eurolex, uh, again, legal uh, collection. But I think the legislative summaries are to be found on the Eurolex uh, website, which is run, I believe it's run by the Commission's uh, publication office. And they are increasingly active in, in providing more tools and providing more structured information for citizens at large. So in your capacity as, as a European citizen and not just as a current or future EU official, those are very good resources that can help your preparation. And then here are a couple of resources that we make available at EU training. So here, certainly on our website, you can find, I believe, more than 1,200 EU knowledge multiple choice questions. So we have over 1,200 uh, multiple choice uh, questions that you can use. Some packages have a limit of 500, but it, it shouldn't prevent you. If, you. if you need more, then you can add, you can buy questions in bulk on top of that. And the system will make sure that, that they don't repeat as long as you have not used up the entire database, which still takes quite a bit of effort and uh, make sure you pick the right package for ASD3 because the questions are sorted and prioritized according to the level of difficulty. So there were, as you might know, there were some competitions, 86 and, and others, internal competitions with a similar component of EU knowledge tests. So that is, uh, and sometimes they ask pretty crazy stuff and, and there was quite a bit of backlash from from commission staff saying i mean you asked us quite nonsensical questions so again the database tries to structure that according to the asd3 requirements and level of difficulty and then there is our pride and joy uh, a recent project that some of you may know others may may hear about it for the first time now it's on eu course.eu so that's uh, an e-learning series of videos and explanatory lectures that I myself do some of it and then two other colleagues of mine who, who are uh, involved in it. So we basically cover everything about EU history and decision making and all the institutions. So history, decision making and institutions. 
So some of the, the stuff that I'm sharing with you comes from that experience from the past few months as we were doing the research and writing the scripts and then presenting it and doing all the visuals of, of how to structure this body of knowledge, which we call EU knowledge. Now, policies are coming, but I'm afraid it's not going to be ready by the time you need that for this particular competition. So it's in the second half of 2024, second half of this year, but it will take a bit more time. So now we're just finalizing the uh, these parts and we have three more modules to add. But if you sign up, that if you, if you get uh, purchase access to this e-learning course, automatically we will upload it into your account, the modules that we're adding in the next few weeks. So those three modules, just for the sake of transparency, are the court, so one on the, on the European Court of Justice, there is one called EU Essentials, because we talk about the Euro, we talk about the EU overseas countries and territories and what relationship they have with the EU. It's a bit of a, a, a mix of, of topics which don't necessarily fit in one module or another. And the one on the European External Action Service is coming hopefully by mid next week. But then again, all the rest and all the other institutions and everything is in the package and uh, as we said if you have access already or, or gain access then we upload that directly into your account so i believe that those are very helpful because we try to do this sort of prioritization as to what's absolutely important what may not be primary information but each lecture and each course is about one hour give or take depending on its complexity and then we have a lot of flow charts and a lot of diagrams and a lot of visual explanations to be sure that you're familiar and you easily understand each of the, the, the decision-making procedures along with the various EU institutions. Uh, and those are valid for six months. So once you purchase it for six months, you can use it as many times as you like. We even have subtitles. So you can, you can, you can see that on the screen or if you are, you can put the audio, then you can still see the, the subtitles. And we got questions before whether there is anything you can download or print. Right now, this is not the case. We are thinking about other formats uh, for, for the, the, the text or for the visuals. But right now, it's an online course that you can access from your computer and perhaps from your phone. We're, we're looking at uh, an app in which you can also download and use it offline if you need to. So if we could go back to the slides, then I'll continue with the rest. And as said before, we give you a discount for that course, just as much as we give a discount for other digital products. So the code will be shown very soon, I believe. So with that, uh, yeah, here's just a screenshot of, of the page of EU course.eu. You need to create a new account there, actually. So if you're on EU training, you, you still need to create a new account. We will merge the two at one point, but for the moment, that is the case. Then flowcharts like the one you see about the Committee of Regions and their decision-making process. So that helps the learning and, and puts everything on screen and makes it much more visual. And there are, as I said, uh, lecturers and speakers, you're truly involved. And uh, we try to explain it in the most accessible way. Right, so let's move on to the written test. And I see a couple of questions are, are popping up, but uh, so Aggie will uh, pass that on to me if I, if I need to address one or the other, but I can see that uh, the team is doing a great job addressing everything that they are able to address up front. Written test, as we said before, it's part of the pre-selection test with the EU knowledge, and then there is a written test on a computer remotely. Now, what to expect? It, there's a written assignment. That's the task. You need to draft some report uh, or minutes or letter or notes. So even the, uh, the, the notes of competition doesn't go into any further detail. One very important point there is make sure that you're, you clearly understand the required and expected format. So if you are required to draft a report, that is slightly different from writing a letter, right? A letter is a tiny bit more persuasive, tiny, tiny bit more uh, emotional is a big word, but, but there is, there's a bit of personal involvement in what you write and what you want to achieve with that particular letter. If it's a report, then it's more analytical, right? Like there's a, a bit of an arm's length distance 
between you and the subject of that particular report. So the words you use, the descriptions you use need to be quite objective and matter of fact. Minutes from a meeting or extracting that from some background document is again, slightly different because that is a summary of what happened in a chronological order, typically. Documents related to EU policies and institutions procedure, that's the frame, right? So it's not gonna be about, I don't know, uh, Elon Musk uh, wanting to go to Mars, but it's about something that the EU does, the institutions deal with, with the policy. So it's kind of a real life setting in the context of the European Union. You'll have 120 minutes and you need to reach at least 50% as a pass mark. The two hours means, uh, I mean, it sounds like a lot, but um, it's not as long as you might think when you're in front of a computer and there is time pressure and you really need to focus on delivering a quality written piece. So in that sense, you need to think carefully about how you're going to allocate your time and how you're going to use it to what sort of task to be very deliberate very conscious how you split that 120 minutes that at first you analyze the background documents or the information that you are given how much time are you going to spend on that then comes some drafting exercise and say okay how am i going to do a very rough outline of what i'm planning to write and once you have an outline you will think about okay let me fill that in and put in a couple of uh, remarks or a couple of points using those background documents, using your own knowledge and your own thoughts. Then come the editing part and say, okay, this shouldn't be here, or this should be in a different segment. This should be in another section. So you do that sort of uh, analytical crafting process. And then in the end, you say, okay, let me read the whole thing in one piece. Am I happy with the flow? Am I happy with the wording? Am I happy with the way I express myself in the context of the particular format that was expected from me? So that's why I rather spend 30 seconds more at the beginning and be very clear about what the task is and what the required format is. Now, there are no formal guidelines on what a letter is or what a note is, what a report is, though good news is I'm going to show you something that is a resource that we've created and hopefully that can help in that kind of preparation. But again, this is not something that you would have. The European Commission said this is how a letter should look. Yes, I mean, letter has certain formal and substantive uh, characteristics. And again, note to a file. Many of you maybe work with that daily or many of you have seen that. Usually it's helpful to follow that format because it's commission officials who will be evaluating your written piece and it's inside the commission. So again, that's the frame in which you need to operate. Language, English, French, or German, as we said before. And ultimately, it's about prioritization and time management. Hence my word on how do you structure that 120 minute with a very deliberate split and proportional allocation of your time to say, okay, I've spent already 15 minutes on this. Maybe I should move on to the next task. So that forces a certain discipline on you instead of going left, right, and center, without following a certain process that can yield the best result in your exam performance. Assi uh, assessing competency. So essentially what it does, it's not a linguistic test. It's not about, and also not a, a, a knowledge test. So it's not about being, it's testing you how much do you know about the EU's agricultural policy or the reform of the common agricultural policy or what have you, some trade agreement that the EU is negotiating right now. The aim there is to assess certain competencies. This is the snapshot of uh, the material that we've created on briefing report, note to the file, which is you know, one, one area, the other we, we call action plan or work plan. Uh, another is like a press release speaking points. And there's much more to this, not just uh, what you see on the screen, it's just a, a little sample. This is available for those who follow a training with uh, a group. So there's a group training on the written test that our coaches and trainers offer, and also individual uh, trainings. And then we also have a webinar, which somewhere features in the slides. So we have a webinar on the, the the written assignment and how 
you can allocate your time, what kind of word use you are advised to, to do, and all of that. So these kind of resources are available on our site on EU training under the products. So you can find it and make sure that you select the right competition that you are preparing for. So written that's how to prepare. Well, practice. Well, that's probably uh, a good generic advice, but uh, hard to, to, to turn that into something fully actionable. One thing is you can certainly try written test simulation that we offer. Currently, we have one on the website, but very soon, meaning within a day or two, there will be three in total. So those are available written by our experts. And then you can also have an evaluation, meaning that you, you do a mock, a simulation, and one of our experts will provide you personalized feedback and to say, OK, here, is, here are your strong points and here are the less uh, strong, the weaker points for improvement in your particular written piece. And that's a personalized piece of advice. And then certainly there is peer-to-peer -peer support. So you may want to create a little study group or a couple of friends or colleagues, two or three, even though formally you might be competitors, but to say, okay, let's generate, let's create an assignment and then we cross evaluate each other's responses and provide feedback and we discuss what was the challenge, how could we overcome it, share best practices and share ideas. And then uh, this is the reference that I mentioned earlier. There's this case study webinar, meaning pre-2023, that's very jargony, meaning that in 2023, EPSO has updated and changed their system a fair bit in terms of the selection procedures. But this particular webinar is applicable for your competition. So it's applicable for this AST3 Commission internal competition, even if this one is not administered by EPSO directly. And then EU knowledge certainly helps. So whatever you study for the EU knowledge bit will carry, carry over to this segment of the competition. So EU knowledge will, will help you understand and process the information much faster. And when you write, you're, you're not going to say something that's that may be inaccurate. So certainly that would not help the score of your competition e or your written test, even if that particular aspect is not directly evaluated. So again, it's not about testing your knowledge. It's about measuring certain competencies but you, you don't want to say something that is completely offhanded or, or something that is completely inaccurate in EU knowledge terms. And then you may want to have a look at the Commission style guide. And believe it or not, there is one. And uh, not necessarily a bad time or a beach reading, but it's, it's a helpful resource. So take a look and just get some basic understanding of what is clear writing. What is, there's this clear writing toolbox. I think you can find it on the Intracom, but even on external websites. Take a look at that and say, okay, what is considered by those who drafted these kind of guidance? Clear language, accessible language, understandable sentences, and good way of expressing yourself, because those will help the quality of your written test as well. And the time management, something that I've, I've spoken about earlier. And then this is just a, a commercial plug for the services for the written test that we mentioned. And as I said before, one is shown right now, but there will be two more coming basically later this week or Monday, the latest. Oral test. So this is step basically number three, and this is no longer the pre-selection. This is already the next step. So not necessarily everyone who participates in the competition will get to this phase because there's the oral test and the interview. So what's the oral test? Well, it's a presentation. and. Um, I noticed a typo, we need to check that. So oral presentation related to your field, meaning it there are two profiles, as you're well aware. So it will be related to profile A or B, depending on which one you have chosen. And most likely you will be able to choose from different topics. So it's not that you'll be given one topic and you say, oh, damn, what the hell do I know about this? more likely than not, you will be given different choices or different options, two or three options, and say, OK, this one I, I feel more connected to or more knowledgeable about. There will be preparation time, uh, so you can take notes, you can think about it. And then your presentation will be followed with, by a Q&A with the assessors. And that usually is a tricky part, because you may get questions that you just don't know the answer for. 
Very quickly, just one piece of advice, but again, we have different webinars and different resources on the oral presentation as such. So one tip I, I'll just share with you is that if you don't know the answer, well, you can say, well, I don't know the answer. Number two, you can try to dig up certain nuggets of wisdom that you remember about the topic and try to present it as if you knew more. That's kind of the intuitive way we, myself included, try to answer in situations where we just don't really know the exact answer. And then there's the option number three, which usually works pretty well, is to say, I'm not sure about the exact answer, but here is how I would find out. Here is where I would look. So sharing information about the method and your way of thinking in approaching that challenge and, and answering that particular question is usually a pretty good way of demonstrating not even knowledge because you don't know, but at least your way of thinking and your proactive attitude. So that usually goes down pretty well and assessors in general tend to appreciate that. Good. So, well, with very limited time, right? Like it's a, it's a quick preparation after all. So it's not that you're going to have hours and hours and the presentation itself is likely going to be pretty short. Now, we don't have information whether you're going to have a whiteboard or you need to be seated or you can use any visual aid or you just simply speak and present. But regardless of those, Generally, your voice, your rhythm, your body language, those are quite important. So paying attention to those, practicing that is pretty important. And that piece of advice applies just as much for the interview. And I see that is, is it in person or online. I think that the notice of competition says it may be in person. So they didn't probably want to commit to having these in person. And it may depend also on your personal circumstance. If you are not based in Brussels and the selection board is in Brussels and maybe if you're in Luxembourg or happen to be elsewhere, logistically it might be more complicated, but presumably there will be quite a number of candidates who will be subjected to the oral presentation and the interview in person. So again, it's, it's not either or, they left their options open. So the interview is not the same as a job interview, right? So it's not for a specific position that you are applying for. This is something uh, to assess, again, your general competencies and also your motivation. So the notes of competition gives different clues. It says, what, what, what are your main drivers for applying for this particular competition? Why would you like to be an ASD3 commission official? Uh, what is your commitment? perhaps to the general European idea, to the Euro European integration, which is a very big question and a very loaded question, but still want to know what drives you in this particular context. Competencies, meaning skills and abilities that you will be needing in that particular job profile. So again, it's not for one particular vacancy, one particular position. This is something for in, in the context of that competition and that particular profile. Right, so how to prepare? Well, with presentation skills, timekeeping, very important, speaking speed, speaking style. So that is, is more about the, the public speaking angle and presentation skills and interview skills. Knowing your field, for sure, depending on which of the two profiles you've applied for and, and the competencies that are being tested. So is it is it the clear communication? Is it perhaps working with uh, colleagues and, and how you interact or how proactive you are in resolving a certain problem? These are things you are expected to demonstrate. And then looking at the notes of competition for, for, for more. And then the most painful tip of the day is recording yourself and then self-evaluate. And I say painful because nobody really likes to record themselves as a camera or as a video or perhaps just your voice and talk about a certain topic, try to express yourself on something that you are not fully knowledge about, knowledgeable about, but you know enough. And then listen to yourself. How do you express yourself? What is the pacing? What words do you use? Do you use a lot of um, um, and different fillers? How do you respond to a challenging question? So these are things that you can listen to and even just doing this once can radically improve your ultimate performance. 
Right. Or a test webinar. So that's another uh, reference, another recommendation for you. So this is the webinar that I had run. I don't even remember when, but not so long ago. And hopefully that gives you more tips and more ideas on this particular test. When you get there, you may want to check this out. And then we also have classroom training and personal coaching, as I said before, not just for the oral presentation, but certainly for the interview as well. And we have really, really professional coaches and trainers who have been who have worked with dozens, if not hundreds of candidates, so they can share a lot of insight and a lot of good personal feedback with you. They're pretty flexible, either in person or online. So I think with that, um, we have quite some time for questions. Though I see that the team has been very, very active answering those uh, from the corner of my eye. I see that in the chat and not sure which ones I have not touched upon yet. You're more than welcome to ask me questions. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you whatever I can or, or provide some guidance. And can you have the slides? Yes, David, you can absolutely have. Uh, you, we will share the slides. We will share the recording. Uh, we have a discount code. I don't know where the discount code is. So if, ah, oh yeah, there it is. Okay, I probably should have clicked earlier. Voila, so we have a 24% discount code uh, because it's 2024. And um, that's a, a nice round number. And you can, uh, you can use that both for the EU course and you can also use that for uh, the everything that's written on the, on the screen. So for the practice tasks, for webinars and, and all the digital products. It, it doesn't apply for personal coaching or, or group sessions, but it does apply for all these online things, including the EU course, as I said, the e-learning course that covers EU history and decision-making and institutions. Other questions. Okay, if we're eligible for both profiles, coordination and financial, which one do you advise to apply for? Oh, I wish I could tell you that. Um, honestly, well, one idea, and, and again, it, it's just so hard to, to, to give this kind of advice, but, but one idea that you might want to consider, as a general rule, what happens in most competitions is that the more expert or the more specialist a profile is, generally, the fewer people tend to apply. So if they are looking for nuclear experts, well, that's a very niche area. And with using that analogy for this particular uh, competition, the one with the, uh, the financial one may be a little more experty, let's say specialized, specialist than the coordination one. So perhaps fewer people will apply for that. So if you really have that possibility and, and you are fully eligible for both and make sure that you are and that you're not disqualified because you've overlooked some work experience or professional experience or anything else. But if you're really, really, if you really qualify for both, then perhaps the financial one, given that it's, it's, it's a bit more targeted. So presumably fewer people might apply for that. Again, take that with a, uh, word of caution, but but that would be my way of thinking. The oral presentation is based on something that we prepare. So the oral presentation, there's a tiny bit of uncertainty there, just for full transparency, of how much background document you may be given, if at all. So you may be given some background information, and then you prepare your oral presentation on that basis, or they offer you two, three, perhaps more, topics and you need to prepare a presentation on that basis. So that is not something we know at this point. I'm assuming that they will communicate that to you in due course. But again, at this particular moment, we don't have that information, but certainly you need to prepare a presentation. It's an oral presentation by definition. So you will likely be expected to, to speak for five, six, seven, eight minutes. Again, not a 30 minute speech, but a short presentation on that particular topic. And it does have quite a bit of kind of best practice of what you're advised to do, how you can express yourself, even if you don't have some visual aid. So like a whiteboard where you can draw certain concepts or create a certain structure. There's a lot you can do with your voice, with your body language, with the way you present that particular topic. 
Can there be trick questions? Same answers, but single word element changes. I'm assuming you refer to the EU multiple choice quiz. I don't expect that because it's a knowledge quiz. It's not like verbal reasoning where there are very similar meanings and there might be a lookalike kind of question, but there's no verbal reasoning in this particular competition. So you have the EU knowledge test. Well, don't mix up the European Council and the Council of the EU and the Council of Europe. But that apart, so the names of the institutions and those uh, kind of low hanging fruits, I don't expect that you would get this sort of tricky trick questions where the wording really makes a difference. The case study material can be a good basis to practice for the written test. Uh, yes, we believe so. So we have a dedicated written test uh, simulation. So that should be helpful. And also on EPSO's very own website, you have uh, various resources and, and samples publicly available. And again, with the caveat that this competition is not run by EPSO, it's done by DGHR. But still, the, the way the test has been construed, you can use those resources to practice. And you can time your, your answer or the process. You say, okay, here is two hours. I'm going to dedicate that. I put my phone aside and I uh, unplug uh, my computer or unplug whatever device may distract me. And for two hours, I'm going to do that sort of simulation and then use that material as a basis. So the methodology is just as applicable here as, as for any EPSO competition. So you can use those resources for that preparation. Okay. I don't see any other question that I haven't answered yet, but go ahead and, and ask me, ask me anything that I'll try to answer for you. All right, I can see it directly on the screen. If we give access to CISPR, do we still need to encode the experience at the in the application form? Well, I believe if you give access to CISPR, that should have all your data. So presumably that will not be necessary, but the application system should be pretty upfront about that. So if you click the, the checkbox and say they, they can access your CISPR, then um, they will tell you what additional information you may or may not need to provide. Okay, it doesn't hurt if we encode the commission experience. Yeah. Well, maybe you want to check your own CISPR profile to be sure that everything is in there and everything is accurate. Because if that may not be accurate for one reason or another, then the selection board may get the wrong information as well. Right. What else? Okay. Uh, case study. This I already answered. Go ahead. Any other questions? Anything I can be helpful with? Now, you don't. Um, need to, to 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 think so super quickly to, to ask all the questions that may be on your mind right now, because if anything comes up in the next couple of days or the next couple of weeks, feel free to send us a message on eutraining.eu and uh, my colleagues or myself will be very happy to answer those for you. So this absolutely holds. It's not just for the duration of this live webinar uh, that we, we answer those questions for you. So feel free to, to reach out at any point. All right, will the written test be only on remote? I'm uh, not working at the commission anymore. Uh, you're in an agency and I'm worried about technical problems using an uncommissioned laptop. Oh boy, the famous story of remote testing. And those of you who followed it or those of you who were directly involved with the all the, the 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 chaos that ensued last year with the remote testing because you couldn't use a commission laptop because you had to have administrator rights and install an app on a laptop and that caused a lot of problems now this particular competition may be a little simpler because it's an internal one and run by DGHR. And for those of you who are professionally and let's say legally involved with the commission they might use a system where you can use your office computer for the purposes of the tests and the exams. That is my assumption. And, and again, this is an assumption, so usual caveats apply, but uh, I don't think that they would require you to use a non-commissioned laptop because all the candidates are, all of you, are linked to the commission by, by definition. So 
presumably that should be a little simpler because it's not an open meaning external competition all right what else uh, is it possible to withdraw the uh, uh, the application i already sent because following the instructions i didn't encode my experience in the commission uh i honestly don't know you need to check the system and if it if there is no button or it's grayed out and you cannot withdraw it or cannot edit it right now maybe send an, an email send a message to those who are in charge because the deadline has not yet passed 27th of march is still two weeks out and presumably you could edit that still and again you need to check that you need to, you need to log in and, and see given that the deadline is not up yet but maybe there are policies that once you send it in you send it in and and that's it you you can no longer edit that so check it out send an email to their customer support or or whatever uh, whoever person is in charge of uh, assisting candidates and it's worth a question oh yeah you delete it and create a new one no editing able okay that uh, boyana that awful thanks a lot so that might be the case that you 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 basically completely delete it remove it and and re submit it all right maybe one or two more minutes so you can gather your ideas, your questions. And as I said before, the discount is still not working. OK, uh, maybe the team can check it to be sure that the discount is, is applicable. Uh, so maybe wait five minutes before you try. But uh, we'll be sure that it works on the EU course and it works on the other on the EU training aim website. Yes, and I see this question. So that uh, Laurent uh, says uh, the max EU knowledge is 500. That's what I, I mentioned earlier that the package has 500, but the, the entire pool, the database is 1,200, so you can add further questions afterwards. There is a way in your dashboard on the EU training website, once you're logged in, there is a way to buy more questions. So then you can top up your quota of EU knowledge questions. Right, uh, make sure you have valid products in here. Okay, those are just the team's answers. So I think we will conclude here unless uh, there is any final question here. I just want to be, say a big, big thanks to, to Rita for helping me with the presentation. A big, big thanks to Agi for helping in the back. And uh, our, our colleague David Herman was also somewhere floating around and the rest of the team. So a big thank you and thank you to, to everyone who, who showed up uh sacrificing your lunch break hopefully you could get some sandwich while i was uh speaking or you be able to have a, a snack afterwards so thank you very much wishing you lots of luck i hope this information was helpful that it it guides your preparation kind of shrinks the problem right i think that that's the greatest challenge with the eu knowledge that it's vast so you want to shrink that for, for uh, a bite-sized chunks and and uh, that can guide your preparation put some methodology in it and i'm absolutely sure that with the right effort with the right mindset you will succeed so with that thank you very much for being here and uh wishing you best of luck to be continued all right see you have a nice day